services provider. It's that time of the year, it's July, it's savings month, and for the last six years or so, at this time of year, we've invited our super saver into studio. Well, we've got Julia in studio, which is lovely to see. Um, the story, I'm going to summarize it because there's a lot to tell. Uh, but a quick summarizer. Uh, a summarizer. Uh, before the financial crisis, Julia was driving uh, in, from Durban to Joburg with her aunt. And her aunt had nice clothes and nice handbags and always seemed to have more money than anyone else in the family. So she started quizzing her and asking her questions. Like, How do you do it? Did You should talk to Warren. So she went to talk to Warren, um, and she had 60,000 rand or thereabouts to invest, and Warren sat her down and put on his grumpy financial advisor face and said, we're going to suck all the fun and joy out of your life. Um, how much do you earn? And she told him. At the time, it was about 350,000 rand a year, if memory serves. And he said, okay, are you willing to do be serious about this? She said, yes, I am. She was 27 at the time. And uh, he said to her, well, are you willing to invest a third of everything you earn? Yes, I am," she said. "Then you can have free. You can use. You can spend about a third at the time. Pay about a third in tax." And she said, "Yes, I will do that." And she committed to it, and she started doing it. Then the financial crisis happened, and probably the only mistake that she's made um, through the last eleven years was when the financial crisis broke. She looked at this and went. Mm -mm, this is scary. And she didn't invest the full third. She invested a little less than the full third. And I'm guessing it doesn't keep her awake at night because she's done very well. But she must from time to time imagine what would have been like had she invested the full third through the financial crisis. Because as the assets got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, she would have bought more and more with the same amount of money. But still, she didn't stop investing completely. And that's an important thing. Many people did. She continued investing through that. And as markets improved, she resumed investing about a third of everything she owned. Now, when you watch a murder mystery on television, there are two main ways in which they do it. They either do a who done it, and then you have to watch the whole movie and wait till the end, and then you find out who did it, and you have to guess all the way through. Or they've got a how done it, and they show you in the opening scenes the murder. So you know what happens, but you don't know how it happened. I think we should do a how done it version. I agree, uh, because I think we've we, we've 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 kind of kept uh, kept everyone in suspense in the previous previous one. So this would be great. Okay, so Julia, we she starts off with the sixty thousand in in cash and is putting away about a hundred thousand rand a year for the first couple of years. And as she earns more, and because she's a professional and she knows what she's doing, um, she got good salary increases during time, and she stuck to roughly the formula for most of that time. Right, Warren? I actually think um, um, there were, there were probably times where where she allowed the the savings to increase in fact you know so so didn't allow her lifestyle um to to um her lifestyle costs to increase as fast as her income was increasing so there'd be times where instead of just saving a third it might have been a bit higher than that um but 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 as a good long um, average a third is right by 2013 julia had a little more than 2 million rand invested and um, the next year was a particularly good year 2013 into 2014 she added a lot of money she was earning then about a million rand a year by then um her salary had increased now before you start shouting at us and saying, well, it's irrelevant because I don't earn that. The principles of what you're going to be learning from Julia this evening or having your mind refreshed about around Julia this evening apply to you whether you earn 10, 15, 20 or 100,000 rand a month. Okay, let's just get that out of the way. Okay. <laughs> the, standard, the standard riposte. Yeah. The standard riposte. Uh, 2013 into 2014 was very good and Julia added a considerable amount of money but it was also a good time for markets and the JSE went up in value and many of her investments were JSE exposed. It went to 3.8 by 2015. It went to by 2017, this time last Last year, she was pregnant with her second child and she'd had the first baby in 2015, had bought the house, had bought the more expensive car and had had started living a little bit more extravagantly. But by 2017, she was pregnant with her second child and had got to the princely sum by this time last year of 4.2 million rand, having invested just 2 million rands worth of capital over the 10 years that she'd been investing. The money that she'd invested had effectively doubled over that time. Her name is Julia, and she's in studio with us this evening. Have you, over the last 12 months, added more money to your investments, or have you just let the market do its work? A bit of both, Bruce. I've added some money, not as much as in previous years. I've decided to add some money to other things like the house to pay off the bond a bit faster and some offshore. But I have, I haven't stopped completely. Um, as you said in the beginning, in the financial crisis, I should have invested more during that time and I think that taught me a lesson I should continue investing no matter what so yes I've continued to invest in um, the stock market but also at the same time investing in other 
things. Now, uh, roughly speaking, Warren Ingram, if we look at the JSE this time last year, uh, the, the JSE sorry, certainly year to date is flat. There's been very poor performance on the JSE. We probably are in positive territory on the 12 months since we last saw Julia. We, we we are, but not. I mean, it's not dramatically. You know, it's not. Uh, it's not a you know sort of a twenty percent jump in the in the stock market. No, it's not. So you were sitting at four point two this time last year. You're now sitting on four point seven seven five six five nine. <laughs> so 4.77 million rand. That's an, an increase of half a million rand in the growth of your investment portfolio over the last 12 months. How much have you added during the last 12 months? I would say probably only about 100,000. So you've had capital growth of over of, 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 of 10% mm. um, on this portfolio and you did nothing. That's the wonderful thing about <laughs> compounding. <laughs> yeah. Explain to me then, the, this. so this is not your entire world. You, you have various worlds. You have money offshore and you, you like I- I exchange traded funds because that's what mm-hmm. Uncle Warren told you to do. Mm-hmm. Are you following a similar strategy offshore, mm-hmm. which we don't see here, and going in exchange traded funds there? Exactly. We've got an online brokerage similar to the online brokerage I use here, low cost and uh, investing in um, – uh, an index tracker in Europe. Okay, in Europe. Mm. But this is your South African money. This is money that we're familiar with over time, that you started with 60,000 Rand 11 years ago, inspired by your auntie, um, mm. who said to you, go and do in- index tracking funds. Don't go for big fees. Go for market performance. How many different index tracking funds are you invested in at the moment? Is it one or two? Is it like half a dozen, perhaps? It's actually seven. Although one, I should, uh, I, I just have so little in, I should actually not count it. So six, probably six, and um, I'll, I'm pl- planning to reduce that over time. Six and a bit. <laughs> six and a bit. And, and if I look at your, your portfolio, there's the DBX Euro. So you've got some Euro money from South Africa. You've got Japan in there. You've got, is that the FTSE 100? You've got the DBX World. You've got a property index fund. The mm-hmm. Satrix 40 is in there. And the Satrix Finney is interesting in there as well, the financial sector of the, of the JSE. Yeah, I, it was one of the first ones that I started investing in. I haven't added to the Finney probably in about six years or something. Okay. But I also haven't sold it because um, of the capital gains and things like that. So I've just kept them. Okay. And, and, and that's the, also the reality of managing the, the downside risk of this thing is because once you start selling your investments, you do then start, of course, attracting um, various taxes um, mm-hmm. as, as you start making money. When we look at this 4.775 million rand to which you've, in which you've only invested about 2.1 million yeah. um, over, over, over the last 11 years, are you stunned by the success of what, what has been achieved here? Yeah, I think if I um, could be in my shoes in 2007, I would never have thought that this is how much I would have. I think my ambitions weren't um, as high as I've exceeded my uh, expectations with um, how this money has grown and what I've been able to do with it. And the reality here, Warren, is actually in the last three years, the JSE has barely grown in value. I think we sort of hit this level of fifty five, fifty six thousand on the JSE about three years ago. We spiked up to 60,000 at some point and it pulled back quite sharply to levels where we are right now, about 55,000 on the index. Exchange traded funds, direct investments, avoiding uh, big fund management costs and performance fees and all that sort of things. How important has that choice been versus going into an actively managed investment strategy? Um, I, I mean, I think certainly in the early days, it made a massive difference. You know, if we if we look at, um, you know, if we go back to 2007, you know, the, the unit trust costs in those days for, for the actively managed um, uh, part of a, of a portfolio were much higher than they are today. And, and certainly in comparison in those days, I think it was Satrix 40 was the. Um, you know, was the one investment that mm-hmm. was around pretty pretty much in, in 2007, and and the price difference was you know a, a kind of a factor of three or four times, and so that um, you know you know capturing that low cost but but the high growth of what the market gave in in that time was a very big part of 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 the reason that Julia got um, a, a lot of that that success. Uh, I think that that's probably changed in the last you know couple of years. Whether you know the unit trust industry is, is smart at selling, but the, but they they have one or two people that look around and go, actually you know um, we, we're losing out now, and and so they've dropped their prices. So so if we were starting today, it'd probably slightly less of an issue, but but in those days it made just an incredible difference. Do you have any regrets of not going in and just buying Nuspers? 
you lie awake at night thinking, if I just tend to put all this money in Nasbat all those years ago, <laughs> I wouldn't even bother to talk to Warren because who does Warren know anyway? Um, would you appreciate the beauty and the joy of the diversification journey that you've taken and the slow and steady and, frankly, very conservative approach that you've taken? Yeah, I'm not very flashy as you've got to know me over the the years. So definitely the slow and steady is my style and I'm happy with it. I'm happy with spending 30 minutes a month managing my finances. I don't like doing endless spreadsheets and saying what if I did this or if I had done that. I don't really have any regrets at all. Um, and I'd rather look to the future to say how is the, what is the, most guaranteed way to reach my goal of being financially independent. And I really think that just doing the same thing, carrying on doing that over many years is the way that I'm going to be financially independent. Your goal was to be financially independent by the time you were 40. Mm. It's approaching. It is. I don't want to say that there's a steam train, <laughs> but it's getting closer. It is. Were you 37 now, 38? Yeah, 37 this year. 37 this, yeah, year. Later this year. Three years of compound growth without another cent being added. Let's be generous and let's give a 10% growth a year, Warren Ingram. Let's do a rough calculation. Uh, give it another half a million by this time next year, 5.3, another 700 in year two. Um, that gives her about 6 million and give her another million. She'll have seven with by the time she's 40. Yeah. Six and a half to seven million rand by the time she's 40, assuming continued growth. Is that financial independence or is that under what you would have hoped? No, I think I'll be financially independent by the time I'm 40. Um, it's a combination of keeping exp- – there's an, a bit of an unknown with expenses, um, children going to school and that kind of thing. That's a bit of an unknown. But I would say I'm quite confident that – our family finances as a family, we, we would be financially independent in, say, three to five years. And that's a big thing, Warren. I mean, to be 40, between 40 and 45 and to be financially independent and therefore be able to get the, the, the right schools, get the right help if kids need help, get, make sure you've got the best medical aid, make sure that you do do the holidays, that you can give your kids the global experience which Julia enjoyed before they arrived. You don't feel trapped and constrained by the fact that you haven't committed to, to investments and, at the time. and that you have no freedom to, to just even take, uh, you know, three months off, you know, and just move from one place to another because you have, you know, if you, if you don't survive, um, generating an income for three months, you have to start selling stuff like your house. So, so those, those decisions are, are, are massive. And, and I feel, you know, for people in the, in the career space, you know, I'm getting to that point of financial freedom quickly. If you decide, to maintain a career, in other words, not, not an entrepreneurial life, that um, you become much better in your career because you, you are left with choices simply because of your finances. Mm. So when you have a lousy boss you know, or, or work in a terrible environment or something changes, you, you, you operate with so much more confidence um, that you don't have this, this crushing pressure of, of the financial burden where you can't just tell someone you know, where to jump off and, you, and mm. you go and get a new job. And if it takes you six months, fine. So, so I think that the, the, the benefits to Julia, you know, it, we were talking about, uh, you know the, the the kind of meteoric rise of her earnings, etc. And I think part of that is this financial freedom. She didn't have the, the complete financial independence, but she had a lot of freedom very early on to be able to say, you know what, if it's really bad, I can stop working for six months and and, and find a new job if I have to. Mm-hmm. And being able to negotiate with with kind of a dodgy corporate boss on the other side um, when you've got that freedom really helps. And so if we look at the – what's so interesting to me is by 2015, by the time you um, had your first baby, uh, and you had the house, the baby, the wedding, um, not in that order. I'm sure it was the wedding. The house, it could have been. It was actually that order. It was the house, baby, wedding. Oh, we, was. I was engaged when I was pregnant, but okay. uh, we weren't married. But we're not judging. <laughs> we're not judging. Nobody's judging. Oh, in fact, we got married at Home Affairs. So in fact, I was married when the baby was born, so she was registered as um, – you did legitimate, it, not did, did you, did you illegitimate. Get, did you get it all done at once? Okay, <laughs> yeah. the baby. I didn't know they offered that service. <laughs> <laughs> Maluski Gaba, I underestimated you. Um, the house, the baby, and the wedding all come along in one year, and of course the more expensive car, because for a long time you drove the Corsa Light. Yes. Is your husband still driving the Corsa Light? No, that car was in costing. It had to costing, die eventually. Yeah, it cost too much to maintain it, and it had to replace the gearbox and whatever. Yeah, okay. So we, okay. yeah, we because that would have been a good story. <laughs> yeah. It's still a good story. It yeah, would have been a better story. <laughs> he traded it and got an excellent deal, though. So it slips on in the. By twenty fifteen, by the time life happened, and this is like the grown up stuff. Up until then, you'd be doing the third, third, third. You've been traveling overseas two, sometimes three times so, a year, and having fun. Thirty six countries by by twenty fifteen. By mm-hmm. twenty fifteen. 
with discipline saving, you've been to 36 countries. It's unbelievable. <laughs> um, you then do the house baby wedding thing, which is the one thing that then or puts a break on investing. And since 2015, your investments have grown from 3.8 to, say, 4.8. It's only a million rand increase over the last three years. Um, and I don't mean to undermine your, your investment price. It's outperformed the performance of the JSE, the outperformed the performance of the market. But still, it does go to show that if you make big contributions early on, mm. you then can afford to have life happen and not go backwards, which many people do. Exactly. I try and encourage every young person that I meet to to start the savings habit earlier because it's just so much easier if you do it. The earlier do, you do it, the better, really. You don't know what you're missing out on if you are putting money aside. Mm. And if you have the freedom also to spend what's left once you've done the saving, that gives you considerable freedom. You're not second-guessing yourself the whole time. Exactly. What has been your biggest learning in 11 years of investing in essentially in markets but go, by going through exchange-traded funds? Mm, that you don't have to be fancy in terms of your trading the stock market and using a lot of jargon and um, – trying to beat the stock market. You just need to be disciplined in um, living within your means. And then the power of compounding does the rest for you. If you can live within your means and you don't max out your credit card every month um, and you can save a bit, yeah, the rest is taken care of by compounding. If you invest in sensible funds that aren't expensive um, and you'll get the returns, anyone can do this, what I did. Um, and what do you say to people who say, but Julia was earning big money when she started out and she was earning 350,000 rand a year in 2007, which was a very good salary then. You're now earning in excess of a million rand a year um, and that's an incredible salary and it puts you in the top 1% of income earners in South Africa. She is not a real example. Um, it's like... I, I really don't. We've we've discussed this so many times, and I, I, I really don't. I keep getting know. shouted at because of this. So, so <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm not asking this question the question anymore. I'm it's not it's the principle, not the actual numbers, right? Yeah. The numbers are just illustrating a principle, which is uh, save, invest, and let your money grow. Um, no matter what that, how much that money is, it works the same. Compounding works the same. It's just the the numbers at the end of the day are different. So. Um, I know people who've uh, a, a few years ago, um, my helper managed to save up enough to buy an RDP house, and she was a oh, helper. This was before I met my husband. And everything, so she's only working for me one day a week. She had peace jobs, and she managed to save up ten thousand rand to buy an RDP house. So. It's possible. It is, and it's, it's about your commitment as to what, and I hate to say using this in what you're prepared to give up, but it's prepared, it's, it's what you want to achieve, uh, and, and, and how much you're prepared to put aside every single month, Warren Ingram, that determines the outcome. It's, and it's, and it's possibly just turning them into little trade-offs all the time. Um, you know, so I'm prepared not to have a, a cappuccino, you know, on my way to work every day, be, because actually, you know, that makes a difference to my, my freedom. It's why he's so grumpy. Um, <laughs> so I mean, what's interesting about the sport fair, Warren, is half of it is exposed to South Africa through the, the Satrix Raffi, the Satrix Finney, and the Satrix 40. Um, and the other half is, is world and Europe and, and UK, essentially. Yeah. Um, um, all, of, all of which have globalized companies. And, you know, is there a, a, the right balance? Is there a better balance? Is this the right mix for Julia? Uh, no, um, 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 simply because I think um, you know Julia ended up buying a bit too, a bit too many different um, in investments in the beginning, and then you know because of the growth got stuck with 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 the legacy that's not not destructive to capital, but um, you know I, I mean I think it could be literally as simple as saying I buy the world. Uh, with with half my debit order every month and half uh, into the forty, the Satrix forty, and and be as simple as that. And and you, I mean, I've never done the numbers to see what the result would be. I think it, it doesn't matter now, but but I think the result would be largely the same. So so if anything, uh, you can simplify it one level more. That 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 split of local versus international. Um, I mean, I don't. I actually think it's not a bad split to have half half. Um, you know, you you could say you know. T uh, I wouldn't do more than that, uh, international, and you could go slightly less, but it doesn't matter. When no. you go to these investment conferences and you have these very important and powerful people who, who draw big salaries to invest money, and some of them do it very well, and some would have dramatically outperformed uh, Julia over the decade, we just don't know which ones they would have been up front. Um, but they say you need to have alpha. 
which yeah. is the outperformance. Does Julia not need to list a little bit of zing in here? No. Uh, tr- tr- <laughs> Her eyes just got bigger. So I don't do zing. <laughs> So, so, so let's look at the at the grand master of alpha is Warren Buffett. The, yeah. the, the man, I mean, the man who's generated far more growth above above stock market returns probably than anybody else. Uh, and and in his will, he says to the executives of his estate, "When I die, take ninety percent of the money we're allocating to my wife." Um, and he does love his wife. This is not a this is not a bad thing that he's doing. Put ninety percent in the index, ten percent in cash. Yeah. That's good enough for his wife. And and. And the reason is because he wants that uh, that relative certainty of outcome for her. Whereas aiming for the alpha, you can get a lot more return in the market. That's absolutely true. But but the flip side is just as true. You can then significantly underperform the market. The, the thing that stands out here is there's no America. Um, you don't have the S&P 500 in here. You don't have the Dow in here. Oh, she says. Yeah. It doesn't bother you one little bit, <laughs> no. does it? And, and, and the U.S. markets have been such stellar performers. Should she not have a little bit of America? Uh, no, because the, the world um, – so that world uh, ETF has uh, – Has America. Has about 50% of the uh, – well, 50% of the world, unfortunately for us and you know, luckily for Trump, is, is America. Yeah. So, so actually when you buy the world ETF, you get, you get America whether you wanted it or not. And I think that that's what's nice about it is if America's uh, stock market is the biggest market, then you should have the most exposure to it, and that's what you get in one simple uh, instrument. What is your strategy from here, Julia? Just more of the same. Because we want to know where you will go. I don't want to sing the song. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, continuing to do what I do in terms of the Will, will you start adding more money, Rama Foria and uh, Rama Reality and uh, Rama Bricks and all of these things? Are you going to commit more money to your portfolio this year or are you happy to let it go along and hit the bond and the the European ETF and pay off the car and that sort of stuff? Yeah, for now, I think that's what I'm going to do, um, the the bond and the the European ETF, and then just uh, increase my um, savings pool in case I want to try something different um, in future. So, yeah. Give, give me a sense of your bond. You've owned the house now since 2015, so you are four years into the bond. Are you a third of the way through? Are you halfway through? You did some renovations, which is always tricky and expensive. Yeah, little ones, though. Little, okay. little renovations, not too expensive. Um, of course uh, not. What did we yeah, do? <laughs> what were no, we the, house, the house was renovated, so it was just yeah. one tweaks, room. Tweaks, tweaks yeah. Um, uh no, we're almost done with the bond, so quite okay. close. So, so when, when, you look, when you look at Julia's performance and you look at 2015, she had had 3.8 million rand invested in markets. And you look at now, she's got 4.775. So she's, there's a million more, and she's hardly added a cent since then. The money has gone to getting rid of the debt. But even the long-term debt that is generally perceived to be okay by most people, she's nailing that debt, which again brings her the financial freedom that when she wants to add to her investments at a future date, and if markets turn and she has a greater sense of optimism in markets, she can chuck more money into markets. It's called financial freedom. She is called Julia. He is called Warren Ingram. It is the update for 2018. From 60,000 Rand in uh, 2007 to 4.775 million Rand. And all she's done is put 2.1 million Rand into that. And the market's ju- done the rest. We just have to say thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for inspiring. Yeah, okay. You don't have to say it. The princess uh, says, I never tire of listening to Julia with Bruce Business on The Money Show. It has inspired me to own the market through Satrix since I first listened to her four years ago. And many such other comments coming through as well. You, you don't, I don't know if you know how many lives you've touched just by coming in and telling people about don't be fools about money. I'm so happy. Good. I'm happy about that. Well, she can. She can afford to be happy, can't she? <laughs>